good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, I'm, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to this uh, leadership uh, discussion. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to Tufts University Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts discussion on leadership. My name is Rachel Kite. I am the distinct uh, privilege of being the Dean of the Fletcher School. Uh, uh, started in October of last year. And I'm going to be in conversation today with Professor Abby Livington, a Professor of Practice at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and uh, an esteemed teacher of uh, strategy amongst many other things in our security studies program. And I'm going to be in conversation with Susan Marie Gannon, who until uh, just a couple of weeks ago was a military fellow at the Fletcher School. We are blessed uh, by a long history of military fellows at the school. Uh, and perhaps Sue could start off by telling us a little bit about what that program involves. But to have a mid-career um, seasoned military officers uh, from all branches of the uh, United States uh, military complex, uh, alongside uh, students from all other kinds of walks of life, mid-career and earlier in their lives at Fletcher, really builds a robust conversation in the classroom and allows us to bring our academic pursuit closer to practice, which as a school of international affairs is absolutely fundamental to our mission. So uh, I'm going to kick off the conversation with Sue and, and then go to Abby and then open it up for questions and answers. I think what's important is that when COVID crisis hit, um, you know, it knocked us like everybody else back on our heels a little bit, but this is at the end of the day, what we train for. Uh, we are a school of international affairs, uh, how one can be a leader um, in complex situations, how we lead when resilience is needed both of ourselves and how do we lead to, in order to be able to build more resilience are questions that we've had an opportunity to explore in a very personal way in the last few weeks, as well as through the pursuit of our uh, curriculum. So Sue, welcome. Uh, it's lovely to see you again. You're back in your office uh, looking uh, fantastic. You played a really critical uh, leadership role um, at the time when the crisis hit, which uh, for everybody in Massachusetts was around about sort of the second week of March. Perhaps you could just talk a little bit about how you got stood up and what kind of uh, leadership challenges you saw and how you would be able to bring both your Fletcher experience and your military fellow experience and your long military career uh, to bearing at a, a very strange moment for a university. Good, good morning, Dean. Thank you, or good afternoon, excuse me. Thank you, and thank you to everyone for tuning in today. So as Dean Kite said, I am, um, I'm a mil was a military fellow here at Fletcher this last year. I'm a reserve officer in the Army. I'm a civil affairs officer by trade, so this uh, COVID-19 response sort of fell into our, our mission bucket, but that being said, um, I would like to point out that the comments I'm going to share with you are representative of what was really a robust team experience amongst all of the military fellows. There's a total of nine at Fletcher, representative of all five services. Um, in addition to uh, the numerous active reserve and veteran military members of the, of the Fletcher community. So the, the lessons learned I want to share with you are, are something that we collectively as a group um, experienced over the last, uh, last now 10 weeks. So when we, we, I first got the call, I made the the common mistake of answering an unknown number on my cell phone. And it happened to be President Monaco <laughs> from Tufts University. Um, and he had reached out to ask us to help um, with the COVID-19 response on the campus. This was just the week before spring break. They were at the time emptying the campus out of resident students and subsequently also had their first positive case, which was a tipping point from them that turned this into more of a, a crisis type scenario. Um, so we, so I went down with one of the other fellows and we, we spoke with um, Mike Howard, who was leading the, the response. And then subsequently on the next day, we were reached out to by Tufts Medical Center, affiliated but not one in the same of Tufts University, by Dr. Apcon and also asked to support their efforts. So the fellows essentially split into two teams that um, we had half of us supporting the university COVID-19 response proper, and then the other half of us supporting Tufts Medical Center's COVID-19 response. The, the observations we gained were pretty common across both organizations, and um, they cover basically four key areas. The first, um, those key areas being decision-making, 
communications, uh, long-term strategic planning, and um, leadership intelligence or presence within the organization in a time of a crisis. And I'll take you through some of our observations in those pieces. So for decision making, um, uh, you know, this is, is a, as a military officer, this is something that we are taught from the time, you know, from the time you're a 21 year old lieutenant, you are taught how to make decisions. Um, and in a, especially under time and pressure. And so in a crisis, you have to look at your organization as to how well structured are they to make decisions in a crisis. And one of the observations that we had with both organizations was they are traditionally and for a reason more of a consensus based committee decision based organizations. And, and there's a reason for that given that given what they do. However, that method of decision making is usually not very, very it's not fast enough or effective enough in times of crisis because you don't have enough time. Decisions need to be made quickly, often with limited or incomplete information. You have to decide what to do with what you know right now with the understanding that you may have to change it later. So within both organizations, uh, there were four key factors within decision making um, that, that we were able to translate into to both organizations. And the first thing as an organization is identifying what are the critical decisions that you need to make. What are the most important decisions that need to be made in the crisis in order to mitigate its impact or respond appropriately? After you've identified those, you then have to identify what are the critical pieces of inf what information is needed in order to make those decisions. What are the critical pieces of information? In the military, we often call those a commander's critical information requirement. Um, it is it is the and these are communicated throughout the organization. Everybody knows that these are important pieces of information. So if they gather it, they send it up. And then once you have identified what information you need to know, you need to identify where is that information being collated to be processed. And I would argue that even military organizations at times have struggle with this because people tend to work in silos. In organizations like both the medical center and the university, they both tend to have very specialized departments that are used to running their own thing. And now at this time, there's a need for shared information across the organization. So I would, that was an adjustment, I think, for both organizations. Both, I mean, did very, did very well. But I think it, in usual day-to-day -day operations, it's not something that you need to do so you don't bother with it. And so for us, it was helping them identify where is that information going and looking at information flow and information um, collection and, and presentation. How do I access the information? And then the final piece of this, and I think one of the most important pieces of decision-making is who is empowered to make those critical those decisions you have identified as critical? We in the Army try to do our very best power down to the lowest level so the decision is made as quickly as it, it, you know at this we say at the speed of the war, or we try to get to the left of the boom. We try to make it before anticipate what needs to be done. If you have to wait for the, the whole bureaucratic bureaucratic staffing process to make a decision, chances are the decision will be too late and it's no longer relevant. So that was that was the things in decision making and we through a variety of different products and, and meetings with the senior teams on both in both organizations. We help them develop that decision matrix methodology that fits their organization the best because what fits in the army versus what fits at the university or the medical center may not be identical similar elements, but you know what what does that product look like. Um, the second piece of this um, that we that now now you've identified your decisions. Your communication, your ability to communicate in a crisis is, is critical and it, you cannot fall back on traditional communication methods in terms of, you know, I've sent out the, the weekly employee email, I've posted it on the, the bulletin board or it's on the, it's on the um, SharePoint. You now have to start being adaptable in how you communicate. You have to flatten, we call it flattening our communication structure so that the relevant information gets to the user of the information as soon as possible. If in a traditional, and the Army is a hierarchical organization, but if we were to sit there and pass it level by level by level, the, use, the, the soldier on the front line is going to get the information too late. So we figure out ways to flatten that structure. Um, I worked primarily at the medical center and they were in, enormously adaptive in how they started to communicate so that the lab techs, the nurses, and the physicians on the front lines, or the housekeepers even, were getting the information they needed. The biggest example of this in the, in, 
forcing this need to be flexible is PPE has been a common discussion point in COVID-19. And the way PPE is used based on the amount of resources available and who gets to use what and when was changing almost daily. So the hospital had to figure out ways to deliver this message and an email was not gonna suffice. I mean, you just can't send it out in an email and hope that you know, the nurse that comes in for her 6 a.m. shift loaded up her email at five o'clock before she drove in. That's not a realistic way to do it. So they really, they deployed, they deployed actual, you know, runners, messengers to go from floor to floor to deliver and do the training. They did town halls with the senior teams. They did all sorts of different events to ensure that this messaging was continuously delivered across the organization. And the key to communications is you have to adapt. You have to be adaptable and what doesn't work, you need to fix it and you just need to figure out quickly how to fix it. The, the third area where we provided quite a bit of support um, that tied a lot into, and I know Professor Lennington is gonna talk when she talks her strategy class, is long-term strategic planning. A traditional military staff, especially at the senior level, has a, what we call the five shop, which is the future operations or long-term planning shop. Most, most hospitals or, or even the university don't have that staff capacity. The people that are doing the planning are also the people that are doing the day-to-day -day work. In a non-crisis environment, that can work because you divvy up your efforts, you're not under this pressure of time. In a crisis environment, the people that are putting the fire out at their feet are not able to necessarily even intellectually separate themselves from what is going on at the moment to look out, in a, out on the horizon and say what needs to be done. As fellows, what we did, part of what we did, it was just we added capacity. We don't know anything about hospitals or universities, but we knew how to um, frame problems. And so what we would do is take that problem framing problem, we would frame it out, hand it back, so they at least had a structure in which to start thinking through that problem, simply because of they did not have the capacity or the depth within their bench, because this is not how they normally operate. Um, from the hospital specifically, they're used to you know, significant events of short duration, think the Boston bombing or an active shooter situation that's gonna, may, they may surge initially, but then it's gonna, it's gonna go back. This, the pandemic definitely presented a long-term, um, a protracted crisis. And I think from the university perspective too, as well, that no one anticipated needing the manpower to do that. Um, and then the, the final thing, the final tidbit, ma'am, and I'll hand it back to you where we were, where we, where we provided some insight is because of the last, you know, mo you know, the multiple years of, of deployments and understanding the continuum that happens in a crisis. You know, when you enter a crisis, an organization, there's a lot of hype, there's excitement, and then you start to surge and everyone's working tirelessly, you're working hours, and then you start to fall off the surge and you start to dip and morale changes and, um, or people become tired and they become weary. And then you may settle into a period of some complacency. We, we helped, um, I, I believe we, we helped provide some insight on how to, how to moderate the leadership presence or intelligence of that continuum throughout the crisis. The presence of the leadership, especially at the seniors level, is, it cannot be understated, but at the same time, you have to be aware of where the organization is in the crisis to help you know, lift them out of periods of complacency but also be empathetic and understanding to the impact of the crisis on, on both, and in both organizations, it's the, the students and the staff in the university, and it's the patients and the staff in the hospital. And they all have unique needs. So we were able to provide some input, um, I think from that perspective of how to, under, how to have an understanding of that and how to, how to tailor that, once going back to the communication, how to tailor that communication to keep the morale going and to keep both organizations going. And uh, with that, ma'am, I'll turn it back to you if you have any other questions. So that, that's absolutely fascinating. You, 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 the crisis, sort of business continuity planning at the university before uh, had been really tailored around a response to the last crisis, right, which had been a one, two day event around the tragic shooting at, at the, the marathon. And here we were going into a crisis which nobody really knew in March, but now looks like it's gonna be a long range crisis coming in waves. And so a sort of semi-permanent state of being now, a new, a new normal. Can I ask you, so you've got, so of that experience of bringing a, uh, a culture of decision-making, a culture of communication, a culture of teamwork, 
that you've um, experienced and mastered in the military. You bring that into a very flat, consensus-driven, you know, um, very different culture and setting. In that sort of very intense experience of a month, what, what will you take back to the military now and in your own practice as a leader from having moved from one culture to another and now, now back into that? Uh, you talked about some insights, uh, but I, I'd just be, as a personal, as a personal reflection, what, was, uh, what stuck with you? No, that's a great question, Dean, and I appreciate it. Um, us fellows keep talking about how much we have learned um, over this past year, and I think, or this past, it feels like a year, past 10 weeks. Um, <laughs> so the, um, I, I, you know, I think in, some of the insight that you bring is, is, is really recognizing in the, the military is, is traditionally very positionally focused, right? So we don't, it's not, you know, Sue in the three shop, it's the S3, the operations guy, and we just say that, you know, he's, we don't use his name, we just use his position, and we have a, a set of assumptions of what's going to happen within that position, and I think one of the key learning points you come from, from working with organizations that are flatter, that are full of phenomenal experts is, is really taking time to understand who is good at what and leveraging that regardless of what position they sit in. And being able to do that in a way that doesn't, you know, you don't want to un upset, the, you, know, ups you know, tell general so-and-so to sit down because we have a private that really knows what's going on. But at the same time, how do we, how do we tap into the ideas and the energy and the um, and the and the knowledge that sits within our ranks, and and to help us adapt and, and and adjust to a crisis. We're very good at operating in a crisis mode, but I will say the army is very slow. Military in general is very slow in adapting to change. Both of these organizations, because they were flatter, were able to adapt to change to me quicker than I would see. I've been working at the Pentagon for ten years and. We don't change quickly. Um, so I, you know, there's, there's definitely um, the, the ability in that flat organization to adapt and mold and change because you're not so worried about that positional piece. Um, I think that is something I will definitely bring forward with me. That's fantastic. So I'm gonna flip the conversation over for a moment now to Professor Abby Linnington, um, who uh, has, uh, for those of you who don't know, um, sort of stormed uh, into uh, Fletcher and um, and has, has really energized uh, the entire uh, campus this past year with her course on grand strategy. And here we are talking about flex and adaptability and adaptive capacity within different kinds of institutions and structures, you know, which seems to be really at the heart of uh, some of the capability you would need to both develop strategy and execute strategy. Um, but uh, Professor Linnington, you worked alongside uh, the uh, fellows and the volunteers in the sort of stand-up effort uh, to try to build the resilience of the university and, and allow us to be able to fulfill our mission, but also to fulfill our service mission to the wider community. Um, so perhaps, could you talk about how you approach strategy as a professor and uh, as a, I mean, as a leader yourself, uh, your, your own career um, and what you take away from the last 10 weeks and what you've learned both in the classroom teaching such a diverse group, but also what you've learned by watching uh, this adaptability over the last few weeks as well. Jane, I'd love to. Thanks for having me. And um, it's a great pleasure to speak with so many of you from across the Tufts community today. Um, so I don't know if it's taking Fletcher by storm. I know the students take Fletcher by storm every year and every semester, and I have very much enjoyed um, coming back into that, that storm together. The first time I came to Fletcher, I was a much younger um, Army captain with about eight years of service as an aviator, and Fletcher was essential to my education as a young military officer and an inflection point in my career as I tried to shift from kind of a tactical level approach um, in planning uh, as an aviator uh, over to um, a career specializing in military planning and strategy. And that is where I have spent uh, or I have my career. So, you know, the military has a very deliberate approach to how it teaches, 
um, elements of planning at every level of command, but then it believes in educating senior members on strategy, um, both military strategy and then how military fits into a broader national strategic um, hopefully to grand strategy, but it might be a little bit less than grand. Uh, and so that was a big part of how I approach um, and, and my learning and the practice of strategy was through that military lens. So when I transitioned uh, and had the opportunity to return to Fletcher, uh, I really took a lot of time trying to figure out what do our students at Fletcher need who are not necessarily coming at it only from a military perspective, but from a very, very broad range. So, you know, we, we estimate that maybe 30% of our population is gonna approach this from the public sector across all functions of government. Uh, maybe, you know, we've, we've got uh, maybe 10% or so that have a military or former military background. We've got, um, 40%, and I hope I get these numbers right, um, Dean, but, you know, that are interested in the pub private sector. And then we have, a, we have another remaining maybe 20% that are interested in, in the nonprofit. And so I was very um, mindful of wanting to go beyond the U.S. perspective of strategy, go beyond the U.S. military perspective of strategy, but to provide the students with what I believe is the core of any strategy making, which is problem solving good frameworks for problem solving. Um, so when I structured the course, I was inspired by um, Bill Martell, who offered the course um, when he was teaching at Fletcher. And for those of you on the call that are alumni, you may recall he was teaching from 2005 to 2015. Um, and he approached it in a, in a very traditional, strategic, um, military and political way based upon his great book on grand strategy from Cambridge University Press. And I, like him, thought that reintroducing strategy was so critical um, for two major reasons. One, um, that any state, uh, particularly a great power like the United States, without a strategic vision or some kind of guiding principles is on strategic autopilot. And that if we are going to have effective state action or indeed for any intergovernmental organization, nonprofit organization, or private sector business, you need some guiding principles that bring coherence to your action in some form. Um, the second real reason for this course is to build the strategic competence of our students, to build that problem solving. And there's a growing body of literature in the international policy and the public policy programs raising concerns about declining levels of strategic competence and the quality of governance in the United States across party lines and across administrations. So having worked in government and prepared analysis for our most senior defense leaders, I can affirm that our track record was, was mixed in being able to produce quality analysis and assessment. And so, you know, as COVID-19 uh, so readily exposed, so I crafted this course to offer a balance between the theory of strategy as it's traditionally taught and the strategic history of empires with um, about half the course focused on practice of strategy making and statecraft. Um, I have more than 50 students in the course uh, and for the alumni in the group, it won't come as any surprise that the best part of any course at Fletcher is the diversity of our student body. Um, in addition to having Sue and the other four military fellows that were in the class, I had about five junior military officers and recent veterans, about half a dozen prospective FSOs, um, former civil servants and political appointees that worked in the Obama and Trump administrations. Um, I had diplomats from Japan, Indonesia, civil servants from India and Greece, students that had run domestic political campaigns in Missouri and Nairobi, and I was really excited to have about half a dozen students concentrating on international business to add their perspectives. So when COVID hit, um, you know, I took a pause in the course uh, to be able to apply the concepts that we were learning in glass to the COVID crisis. Um, and when we regrouped online, I had the students compare and contrast 
country responses to try and trace what was the strategic approach of each country and to the extent that they could develop measures of performance and measures of effectiveness to assess how effective were those approaches and then watch how those strategies would unfold in the remaining of the class. I had students that looked at cross sectors. What was the manufacturing uh, industry in the United States' response to COVID-19? How was the healthcare interest, um, industry adapting? Um, and then I had a, a group that came in and they talked about what they were doing on the outside, as Sue just mentioned, with Tufts Medical Center and also with the, with the university writ large. So we had an in-class discussion to apply the principles of strategy and planning. And then I think it was probably, Dean, at least a dozen, um, if not more, of both the military fellows and students, um, some who had a military background, but some who did not, who really jumped into the fray to say, what did the university need for me right now and how can I help? So a um, couple of those examples, I mean, you just heard great, great feedback from Sue about what she was involved with. We also had students in our class who self-organized student volunteers, all from a distance so that we didn't, you know, continue to spread the virus, um, to organize student volunteers for food delivery as Tufts University shut down, but we still had people that were on campus. Um, we had students that, that helped stand up the Emergency Operations Center. That was a new vehicle for communications that Tufts University used to um, facilitate internal communications. Um, we had um, one of Sue's fellow military fe um, fellows helped the Tufts University uh, leadership, um, both with President Monaco and with um, Mike Howard, really begin a series of discussions about what will be the future of Tufts University long range planning um, in the wake of how this will affect summer school and fall planning and classes. So, you know, all of these different students brought what skills they had to the table. Um, they brought the, the uh, concepts that we used in class and they had a, they have a real world example to be able to test their mettle against. Um, and it was, a, it was a really impactful opportunity and experience for all of us. So this is an unfair question, but you know, I'm just gonna go for it. And, and by the way, to those of you listening, um, uh, the Q and A box uh, you can find at the bottom of the Zoom screen. And if you have a question, uh, please uh, type it in there and we'll, we'll, we're just going to about to go to Q&A after I've asked my one unfair question to Professor Livington. So when, you, uh, when you, you've now got a few more weeks of watching the world uh, respond to this crisis, and it's a crisis that begets other crises, right? So it's a health crisis, it's a series of economic shocks uh, that are bringing on financial crises, there are going to be crises of, uh, of human security uh, in some parts of the world uh, as a result of both the health crisis and the economic crisis. Uh, and when you see the world responding to it uh, in different ways in different uh, parts of the world, um, you see the international system straining to stand up uh, an international coordinated response. Um, and here you are teaching, uh, having taught a, a course on, on grand strategy and looked at how great powers have been strategically capable or not. Are there one or two big lessons that are jumping out at you right now when you pick up the newspaper or, or go online to read the newspaper every morning with your coffee? I think the examples that have stood out to me are the examples of countries that have had very systematic responses and to try and unpack why they have had such a a successful, a deliberate approach and a successful deliberate approach. Um, as I read the analysis, and, and granted it's early, but still I, I think that, you know, if we use the initial measures that it seems like most of us have turned to in terms of being able to measure cases, um, numbers of testing that's being done, clearly um, deaths in COVID-19, the country Definitely, um, that are worthy of analyzing are the examples of Taiwan, 
of um, Japan um, and of Korea. Um, part of this is informed by the fact that I lived in Korea for two years and I lived in an extremely dense um, living conditions in Seoul. And to watch how they have been able to control mm -hmm. the spread of the virus, despite how that urban environment, um, I think is really fascinating. And in a democracy, um, to be able to balance the issues of individual rights, but also communal rights uh, in a very, very different way than I think the United States has approached it. Um, but also with, um, I would say, a relative degree of transparency. Um, I, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't study journalism closely, um, but I, I think that they have been involved quite a bit in, in sharing the science and the information of what has worked for them. Um, but I also think that watching how the society has come together, again, in a very dense urban way to respond to the crisis is a bit of a contrast to how the United States culturally has dealt with this. And the results in terms of transmissions and deaths really do speak for themselves. Um, and, and I think it's being very forthright about what our planning assumptions are at every moment in this crisis and how they need to shift as we develop responses is always a critical part of, of developing next order plans to attack the problem. And I don't really feel like it, it, that discussion of assumptions, I think it's happening across the medical community in the United States, but it seems like they're having to do it and organize their mechanisms for communication themselves, and that there's not really um, a mechanism for cross-sharing um, at the federal level in a way that we might like, um, and it's not even at the state level. And so I think that's been very eye-opening for us as Americans, um, you know, the responsibilities that we believe reside at the federal government level versus the responsibilities we believe at the state level to really ask ourselves, are we comfortable with the choices that we've made here in the United States and compare them with the choices that other citizens have made around the world? It, it does seem to me that there's, um, you know, some of the, some of the things which uh, uh, have, have made the United States a very strong and, and resilient economy for, for many decades are either at a point in evolution or um, uh, or we find ourselves in a moment where they're, they're, they're perhaps not strengths, right? So uh, there's, there seems to be a, a bit of a, a brittleness that has seeped into our society and the economy uh, um, for, for all kinds of structural reasons. There's a brittleness around the extent to which we do or do not trust um, institutions and centers of norm of, of you know the authority that you would go and look to in a, in a time of a crisis uh, there's obviously resilience within communities right uh, individual spiritual leaders individual you know elected leaders we can see a very a patchwork across the country um, so I, I think this is going to be uh, really fascinating to, to study this as we come into the recovery phase and then go beyond I want to flip back just a question to Sue and I'll come back to you Abby before we I think Corey Diamond, my colleague, is going to sort of field some of the questions that are coming in in the Q&A section. But um, Sue, you talked about, you know, helping the university uh, move rapidly to a, uh, a, a sort of a place where it could then uh, adapt freely as new information was coming in and new information needed to go out and assumptions could be altered in, in, in real time. Now, when I look at the I, I look at the planning that we're doing at the university level, we're we're dealing with a virus which is going to come in waves. We're dealing with a timeline for immunity within the community, either developed through herd immunity or through a vaccine, of a timeline which is extending out by months, maybe even years. And so we're going to be living with this virus, right? As are all other institutions across the world. So in the do you have much to say about how to stand up and then how to stand down and then how to stand up again and then how to stand down? What does the military teach us about a, a res, sort of reserve level of flexibility and resilience that then can be um, uh, really um, accentuated when needed and then sort of recede back uh, into, into sort of the background noise when not needed? 
Thank you, Dean. So I think that um, one of the, first of all, I think if there's, you know, there's the theory of never let a good crisis go to waste. Um, so I think if anything, this, this, is, this event has taught both the university and the medical center um, has exposed some of that maybe internal brittleness that they needed to think. The first step of that is identifying what those brittle areas are. And that takes some very honest reflection at all levels of leadership. Um, there is a tendency, and I would say even when you send a, a military unit out to one of the training centers, they'll slug it through and they'll have, they'll be shut down. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, they'll be slapping high fives and they tend to forget to stop and reflect on these lessons learned. And I think that that's an important piece is, is identifying that. One of the things that we are working on at the hospital with still as that effort continues is what we're calling their pandemic playbook, which is exactly what you said. So phase zero being their steady state operations. Phase two is when they saw the, started to see the indicators and then, you know, how do they flex in between the phases and what are the, the key constraint at the hospital is going to be the resources of staff and people, mm -hmm. right, and how, how they can flex up and down and, and based on the state's guidance, how much capacity they need to have available in order to start reopening um, to bring their revenue back, which is also going to impact their ability to flex. So it is really a holistic problem solving approach in terms of you can't just look at it from an operational standpoint in terms of like, these are the things, you know, if, if we have X amount of patients, mm -hmm. we have as many students, we just go to online or we just go to, or we just shut down these operations. You have to involve the, the, the key, just key planners and decision makers in all those different areas, finance being a huge one of them. Um, but it's really, you know, you have to start with what you've learned and then apply it um, in a way that says, okay, if this, you know, and, and, do what we would call a simulation and say, okay, so if the second wave hits in six weeks, based on what we've learned, you know, these first two things we did not do well, this is what we're going to do different here. This, this is a good one that we're going to keep this, this method of, you know, emptying out the campus or whatever it is that we did, but it re it really requires some humility, some vulnerability at the highest levels of leadership to have that honest reflection because what you think happened as a leader often is not how it was perceived down at the lower levels and you have to you have to gain some of that input if you don't then then you what you think is happening and what you think the impact yeah. is may be very different and um but but that is i think we need to stop ma'am if you have any comments on that no i, I think i think that, that, uh, that your last point about humility i think it's really important and my takeaway from this crisis is uh is I was, I've been extremely impressed with with the way President Monaco is is open to getting the best ideas from wherever they come from, and that that not every leader is comfortable doing that, but he's he's really done that. And of course, then the this ethic of service that is so strong at Tufts and at Fletcher. So it wasn't just about the the castle on the hill; it was about the community that we are part of, and how how do we uh, turn our strengths uh, as an advantage to the wider community as well. I think it's also interesting when I look at countries around the world and parts of countries around the world, the question that Professor Linnington asked in her class about, you know, so what is the manufacturing response, etc., is that you, you can see that those leaders who are prepared to say, I don't know, but we're going to figure this out together and I'm going to be very transparent with you when we know, right? Uh, and it's, that's both in the relationship to the use of science or whatever. They seem to be doing a better job in terms of being trusted by whoever it is they're trying to communicate to. And I think there's lots of learning there. But Professor Lennington, I wanted to just, I, I'm going to ask you yet another unfair question, but when you look at the uh, response then around the world and you, so if you listen, if, if we take what uh, Sue's just said about the pandemic playbook for the university, so the ability to flex as and when the pandemic sort of phases up and phases down, when you look at uh, the pandemic playbook now for, for the state of Massachusetts or for the, for the United States or for any, for any other country, how do, you, um, how do you build more resilience and flexibility into the, into the system? Because this is the beginning of a series of compound crises, which we can predict will last a decade. And we, we don't want to build something that fights the last crisis, right? These are crises that are going to sort of knock on other crises. So how do you how do you make it be forward looking uh, as opposed to, uh, OK, this is something that would have worked for last year or for last year's crisis? I think one place 
that we can start is, I know it is looking back at perhaps the last battle, so to speak, but to pull out what was the U.S. government playbook for mm-hmm. pandemic. I mean, it had, it had been written, you know, less than a year um, into the administration shift uh, in January of 2017. So I was on the phone with actually another Fletcher PhD graduate who has a specialty in biochem who works for Health and Human Services and who had participated in, um, over the course of a decade, the exercises that we have as a government on how to handle pandemic. I mean, this is a known problem. Um, We can change the assumptions about how big and and, um, how deadly and, um, but one of the core assumptions in all of those plans was that the US government had testing capability. And all the plans went out the window when we, we indeed didn't have that. And we weren't going to mobilize that on a federal level. We were going to let individual states and communities and hospital systems figure it out on their own, which it's still, you know, that's where we are today, three months later. And it's a bit staggering that we could even go back to the basic framework for the policy experts that worked on this problem and see the gap in how we've responded to the crisis. That's great. Um, something that, okay. No, sorry, sorry, you cut out for a minute there, but I'm not sure, it may have been me, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was just gonna say, picking up where Sue left off on, on lessons learned, you know, one of the traditions that we have um, in the military that I know has has followed over in, to some degree in the private sector and in the public sector is this writing down what happened. Um, and we're actually doing that to try and capture what happened at Tufts University this summer um, before all the fellows leave and on the minds of Tufts leadership um, and Dr. Abcon's mind that we can capture how did we do, where do we feel like the gaps were, what could we do better next time. And then once we have that written down, we could then test that by changing our basic assumptions about what happened. And, evolve the scenario, if you will, about how you, and and then test the system against newer scenarios or more difficult scenarios than the one that we just faced, so that we test the system harder than perhaps we've even been tested in this particular case. Yeah, I think that's a really excellent point. It would be really useful at the the level of the university, and and there's a good is a good way of operating for a private company or for a municipal authority or a federal agency. Um, I'm going to flip over now to, to Corey Diamond, my co- colleague. He is, uh, he's fielding some questions that are coming into the Q&A uh, box. Corey? Thank you, uh, Dean Kite. First, just a comment. There are some folks from the Army on here who say they're cheering wildly for uh, Lieutenant Colonel Gannon, so just so <laughs> she knows about that. Um, <laughs> And here's a question. Uh, It says much communication strategy seems to be about protecting top level decision makers rather than empowering people with the information um, and giving them what they need to take action. Um, So can you talk about what are some antidotes to this? Um, So I'll I'll go ahead and start a little bit on this. Um, I think it's a really good question. I, you know, I think as a, as a leader, an anecdote to this to ensure that your organization does not do that as as a, as being a the leader of an organization and making sure that your staff is not trying to just protect you, the senior decision maker, and the organization writ large. Is you have is it comes with the leader coming in with a vision and and getting the buy-in of the organization and establishing that ownership of the organization's mission and buy-in. Um, from the beginning in order to ensure that 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 dissent and that vulnerability is accessible at all levels. Um, I think that if you if if, if in I think sometimes leaders inadvertently um, squash that without realizing it. Right. So that comes down to surrounding yourself with people that are that you trust that are going to say, hey, this is not we are your strategy is this, but we're, we are not we are not opening the door for the additional discussion and and people are just now going to act to preserve the strategy. I think for me, as a, as a leader, it's a very personal action that is that needs to be taken in terms of identifying what that vision is, getting the buy-in of the vision, 
And then, and then you have to empower that, that discussion, that dissent throughout the organization. Uh, Professor Livington, do you have anything on that? Yeah, Sue, I think that's a great start. I mean, I, I agree that, you know, it all starts with the leader continually reminding people that they are not infallible and showing a willingness to challenge themselves or be challenged by not only other people, but by alternative views and information. Mm -hmm. And that's why the critical information uh, are about what information do I need to know? Where does it come from? How does it get gathered? Is one way to keep some objectivity driving in the system towards the answers that you either want to um, defend the hypothesis or to refute the hypothesis. Um, part about that is being, again, transparent about the assumptions. You may have why you have that view very clearly based upon what facts and what assumptions about the world, then you can much more transparently say to people, please challenge me if you don't agree or you have different information that feeds into these facts or you have a different assumption about how the world works or will work in the future. And then you can have a more candid debate rather than hiding behind you know, broad assertions. Um, which many strategies are just that. They are broad assertions, and it takes a great deal of time and effort to pull them apart and figure out what are those items. You know, we were, we were using the iceberg model in class to talk about the views that we all see above the ocean and all the two-thirds that lies beneath that we typically don't talk about that are feeding our views, and we need to have a more open conversation about that. So, and the leader has to be willing to have that conversation. So I think that uh, we are almost uh, out of time. In fact, we might, we are at time and uh, you can see the richness of this conversation. I mean, I've, I've got 10 questions that I want to ask uh, both of you. Um, and so this is just a microcosm of the richness that can exist in the classroom at Fletcher. It's uh, within our alumni community, within the extraordinary community of fellows who are attached to us. Uh, and I think that, you know, this is a moment when we will have to not only continue the excellence of our educational mission, but also take this mission in real time and help it be a problem solving tool uh, for, for the university and for our partners and for the world around. As, uh, as Professor Linnington said, you know, at the end of the day, uh, strategy is about problem solving. And uh, we have got a set of interlinked and complex problems now in front of us uh, as a society, which uh, requires those uh, global leaders, those globalist uh, leaders that Fletcher has been putting on the field of play for so long requires more of them than perhaps ever before. So um, uh, thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to the alumni team, I think, for a final message. And uh, we hope to do more of these uh, chats again in the future. And if you want to catch uh, Professor Linnington live, uh, then enroll at the Fletcher School. <laughs> uh, or uh, certainly we'll be uh, teaching over the summer with Fletcher Summer Live. And uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Susan Gannon will be found uh, performing an extremely important mission in support of the United States efforts overseas uh, to uh, support a, a fairer and more sustainable world uh, between the relationship between the military and USAID. So she can be found downtown DC if you want to stop and ask her any more questions. Uh, anything else from anybody? Thank you for the opportunity, Dean. No, thank you. Thank you for your service. Great to be with you all today. With that, it's uh, over and out. Thank you so much and uh, be safe, be well, and uh, thank you for everything that you do to make the world a better place. Bye-bye.